coming days. Globally, we should be in prayer as well. You do re realize that the second fastest growing church in the world is in Afghanistan. Obviously, Afghanistan is under it right now. And many of our brothers and sisters in Christ, where we get to come together this morning and worship freely, worshiped last night at some point in time in secret for fear of their lives, but they were faithful. And we need to pray for continued faithfulness for our brothers and sisters there in that persecuted region in the time of trouble that they're in right now. So in these areas, and with that in mind, would you join me in a word of prayer before we dive in? Father God, we are so thankful for who you are. <laughs> you are our anchor in every way as we have sung. And Lord, for these families, uh, they need an anchor, and we thank you for the hope that is that you are good and that you are God and that they can trust in you and that they can even carry their burdens and drop them for you to you because you are a good father. And so, Lord, we just ask that you would bring comfort and the peace that passes all understanding to these. Lord, we also pray for our world. Our world needs Jesus. Lord, we realize that you are never going to be cruel to your bride, but that you have a reason for everything that you do within the church. And so, Lord, even under persecution, our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world, you are going to use that for great flourishing and the spread of your kingdom. And so we praise you for that. And we look forward to the day where you call us home together. Until then, would we be faithful, whether in persecution, Lord, or whether in opportunity of blessing, would we find um, our contentment in you and our completeness in you? And now, Father, as we turn our eyes towards relationships in marriage and even in our singleness, how we can glorify you, Father, we just ask that you would guide and direct this conversation and that these would be your words and not my words, and ultimately you would be glorified in all of this. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We've been going through this series, InstaFam, talking about different aspects of the family. And last week, we talked about how a wife in a difficult circumstance in marriage is able to um, be faithful to God and what God would want from her in that context. And today, we're going to start off by talking to husbands in a difficult or challenging marriage, in a context of what am I supposed to do and how am I supposed to react in this type of circumstance and situation. We did that by looking at 1 Peter chapter 3. And the wives, they had to go through verses 1 through 6. And the men, it's just one verse, verse 7. And you might say, that's not very fair. Well, the Bible balances it out because when we looked at Ephesians chapter 5, there was a very short admonition and encouragement for the women and a very long admonition and difficult admonition for the men. So we're balanced out and uh, we praise the Lord for his full and complete word. We're going to look at 1 Peter 3, 7 right here. It says, likewise, husbands. That likewise is interesting because it's connecting it with the conversation before, which was to wives. Now... If you missed last week, I would encourage you to go and watch that because I'm not going to do much here, review here this morning. We're going to move right into husbands, all right? But last week, we did look at wives and how they are able to forge forward and move forward in a difficult relationship for the glory of God. And he's saying in that same context, right? Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. I'll get to that. Don't freak out. We'll explain exactly what that means. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. He starts off when he says, live with your wife in an understanding way. Fight to know her. Fight to understand her. Be able to repeat 
what is going on in her heart and in her mind back to her. I can, I can tell you that in my own life, when Cheryl and I will have an area where we wouldn't agree, much of that, most of the time, is a failure of communication. Like, we aren't actually as far apart as we think we are. We're just not connecting in an understanding way. We, we don't understand each other's hearts. And so one of us is sitting here thinking one thing, assuming things about the other, and the other sitting here thinking another way, assuming different things about another. And what we're not doing is turning face to face and having an actual conversation where we can learn to really understand the heart of each other. And so a good practice that we've had to get into is let me understand what you're concerned about or what you are saying is blah, 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 blah. And then she would say, no, not at all. That's not what I'm thinking. That's not what I'm saying. Well, what is it? I want to get to the heart of it. Let's have a real conversation where we're on the same page. This is saying a husband, his first step, if there's challenge or tension in a relationship, is to fight to understand the heart of his wife. Don't assume what her heart is. Don't just rush to conclusions, but take a step back and ask the Lord to give you wisdom and understanding as far as her heart is concerned. Now, it can be a challenge for a man to completely understand a woman. You've heard the joke, right? There was... A man down by the Jersey Shore and a bottle came up and he picked up the bottle and he rubbed the bottle and out came a genie. And the genie said, rough economic times, you just get one wish. And he said, all right, my wife has always wanted to go to Hawaii, but she's afraid of flying and I'm not gonna sit on a boat that long. So could you make a road from the Jersey Shore all the way to Hawaii? And he goes, oh, there's just no way. The, the structure would take way too long. It would be way too difficult just to make sure that it was safe. And, and I can't even imagine the engineering nightmare that that would be. Do you, have, do you have another one? He goes, yes, yes, I do, I do. I, I'm having trouble completely understanding everything that my wife does. Could, could you help me understand my wife completely? And he says, would you like that a two-lane highway or a four-lane highway? We understand that we're created different and uniquely. But I will tell you this, every husband should desire to have a PhD in their wife. You should study to know her heart because God has called you to shepherd her heart. And you can only shepherd and love what you truly know. You cannot shepherd something that you do not know, and you cannot protect a heart that you do not understand. And so you say, Lord, as much as possible, help me understand the heart of my wife. And here's the problem. Many times, we're different. One might be a feeler, and the other one's a solver. So sometimes your spouse might be telling you how she feels, and immediately you go into solve mode right? Well, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to do this and this and this. She doesn't want to be solved. She wants to be heard. She wants to be understood. She doesn't need a game plan. She needs a listening ear that's able to hug her and understand where she is coming from. Too often I go this route. I hear what you're saying. I understand the situation. However, I don't feel how you feel, so you shouldn't feel that way either. Let's move on together. And it's like, no, 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 no. Fight to understand me. Know my heart. Husbands, do you know the heart of your wife? Are you understanding in her feelings? And so, well, one of the areas that we can grow as godly men leading our families is to consider our wife's perspective, perspective and understand what we can. Show honor 
he says to your wife. How? By understanding her, by fighting to know her well. Second thing that we can pull out of this one verse is this, um, that we are to consider what she desires and give it to her. As he says, showing honor to your wife, placing her above yourself, her desires above your desires. Now, every wife should applaud right now and thank me for that because this is what this means, men. It means this, you lay your yes down and as often as you can say yes, you take joy in doing that. So your wife has a desire, your wife has something that she's asking for or wanting and your first response is not, No, that doesn't fit with my perspective. Your first response is this. I want to say yes. I'm laying my yes down before we have this conversation. I want you to understand, my wife. I want to say yes to you. Now, let's have this conversation. After the conversation, you might say, as much as I wanted to say yes, in good family wisdom and godly wisdom, we can't say yes to that. We have to go this route. We can't afford that desire. We can't act in that way at this time or whatever it might be. So it's not that it's a carte blanche yes to everything, but where you can say yes. Lay it down, prefer her in these circumstances. The world gets this. The world will tell you this, a happy wife, a happy life, right? It it, it gets it with us. Well, that's biblical wisdom. As a matter of fact, believe it or not, in Deuteronomy 24, verse 5, a Jewish family that were put together, in those days they had arranged marriages, right? Kind of crazy, but there would be a husband and a wife, and they were joined together, and they were not allowed to, even though by law they were supposed to, go into the military for a year if they were a newlywed. And the verse basically says this, that the husband should learn for that year how to make his wife happy. Don't go to war. Don't get distracted with other things. Spend a year learning how to make your wife happy happy. That's what the challenge is here. Bring happiness to her. I I can tell you this, that if God allows us to succeed in this area, we will not have any problems with a wife or family following our leadership. If she knows your first desire is to say yes, if your first desire is to understand her, then in those moments where you have to lead in difficult ways through difficult challenges and even intentions of your marriage, there is going to be a trust there of equity that has been built up over many, many, many heart care decisions that you've made. It's not always easy. The other day, my wife and I We're out shopping for a car. She needed a car, and she wanted a Beetle. And I said, honey, I'll never drive a Beetle. It's just not my thing. And she goes, aw, I want a Beetle. (laughs) Guess what we have in our garage right now? A Beetle. Not because I desire the beetle, I didn't want the beetle, and frankly, I'm not much going to drive the beetle. But it worked. You see, God has given us the great joy to be a giver. God loves to give. And one of the ways that a husband demonstrates the Imago Dei, the image of God, is by being a giver to his wife. And so every woman in the church right now is hitting her husband in the ribs and saying, I want a Lexus or I want a... (laughs) Consider what she needs and lead her to it if you can. This is a more challenging conversation, men. 
This isn't just talking about what she wants. This is talking about areas in which she needs to mature in the faith and how you are the priest of your home, the pastor of your home. And as the pastor of your home, you lead your family towards godliness when you see that there is ungodliness creeping into it, even in the conflict of a husband and wife relationship. You cannot be timid or passive in leading your family. You cannot be timid or passive in moving your wife towards all good things. If she is overcome with worry, help her to find sufficiency in Christ and his foreknowledge. If she is struggling with her temperament and the kids are being affected, bring it up graciously and carefully and tell her that she is the most influence on your home that the tenor of the home is going to be built in many ways through her. And let her know that you're here to help, to forgive, and to encourage as much as possible. I remember a journey that my wife went on. My, my wife and I went on early in our marriage. She really struggled with the security of her salvation. I said, listen, honey, this is going to keep you a baby Christian. Let's, let's dig into this together. Let's get some concrete understanding of who you are in Christ and what salvation is all about. I, I, I could not leave her in that space and be a good husband. Now, here's what I can tell you. If you are going to encourage your wife in these ways, then you better be growing yourself or it will not work. She will not want to hear anything that you have to say. You don't have to be the completed version of Jesus, but she better know that you're working on being like Jesus or else this will come off all kinds of ways horrible. Well, I'm just trying to lead the family. Yeah, it starts with you. Submitting to God and Christ. It never works if we're not growing, if we're not taking our junk first and dealing with it, and they know that that's a part of the process and rhythm of your everyday life. And so for your wife to follow your leadership, you need to be growing, you need to be loving, and you need to be humble. And if you're missing any one of those keys, it's gonna be a challenge. It's gonna be difficult. And what I can tell you is this, approach trumps content all of the time. You say, what do you mean? How you approach conflict is more important than how you try to heal conflict. You don't come in as a, as a know-it-all, you don't come in in a judgmental way, but instead you approach it in humility. You approach it with grace. And then the scripture says that we're to treat them with respect. And this passage is assuming that you're in a difficult relationship, that you're in a difficult place. And you say, well, I should only give respect if they earn respect. But that's not what the passage says. It says you treat them with, with respect, period. Whether on that day you think they earned respect or not. Treat her always, it says, with respect. Why? Well, he says, for number one, they are physically weaker. I believe that that's the context of what he's talking about here. He's just basically saying, listen, you have a responsibility to protect your wife because physically you are stronger. And we talked a few weeks ago about how if there's something that goes bump in the night, you don't Hit your wife and say, would you go downstairs and see what's going on? I'll stay up here under the covers hiding. No, you'll say, oh, hey, I'm going to go check it out, right? And you go downstairs. It, if, if you go home tonight as husband and wife and have an arm wrestling match, the majority of you will find that the male will win. Not in every case, but in most cases. Why? because he's physically stronger. That's what this is saying. You're physically stronger, so protect her. Protect her, respect her. Respect the fact that she needs protection. 
And so he's saying that is one way. Don't use your strength to dominate it, dominate her or to subjectify her, but instead use it to protect her and encourage her and give her a safe space to know that you're there. Second reason to respect her is because she is an heir in the family of God with you. Particularly in the uh, Old Testament or even first church context, this is radical because only the firstborn male and males would receive the inheritance. And so what God is saying is this, I value a woman not like in the way that your culture does, but much, much more. She is my daughter, and she receives my inheritance. She is a jewel to me, and she better be a jewel to you. And so God is is sharing this radical in this time as it was read during the time that Peter was under the influence of the Holy Spirit sharing this. This was like crazy mind-blowing for them. Today, it would be understandable, but then it was radical. She is a, the king's daughter. She has the same standing before God as, as I do. Not only that, she has the same standing before God if she's a child of God in the power of Christ as Christ does in many ways. You do not want to mistreat the king's daughter. That won't go well with her father. And it's always good to be reminded of that. Husbands and wives, as we speak to each other, we're the very family of God. And we should treat each other with that dignity, value, and respect. Individual jewels precious to our Heavenly Father. not demeaning in any way, but respectful. You know, it matters to me. Whoever comes to ask for one of my daughters for their hand in marriage, because they're my daughter. And one of the questions I'll ask is something like this. I've spent my life caring for her, protecting for her, with her, laughing with her, having vacations with her, giving my best to see her flourish. What makes you think that you're ready to come and take my job? I want to know the answer to that question. Why? Because she's my daughter. <laughs> And in the same way, God would say to every husband, this is important that you lead her well with respect because she is my daughter. Be careful. Be gentle. Be loving. The last one is interesting. The scripture says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Your relationship with God is an, impacted by, by how you treat your wife. Like, like how I am treating my wife, it has direct correlation to how my relationship with God is going. They're, they're part of the same connection. So if I'm treating my wife poorly, but I'm saying, oh, but I'm very close to the Lord and I'm growing and walking in my faith. No, not true. It's interfering with my relationship with God. It's interfering with the conversations that I have with God in prayer. That's exactly what this scripture is saying. And so we are praying, God, God, allow us to respect God. In mutual respect, husband and wife, and thrive. Will God allow us to do that as we walk through, no matter what your relationship is? Maybe it's a 10 out of 10, maybe it's a 2. 
What do I do? It respect each other for the glory of God and for the good of your flourishing, for the good of the flourishing of your home. And that's exactly what this passage is calling us to. As we consider the family of God, and as we consider the church, and how even this conversation more broadly connects, I think it's important for us to understand that the the church in many ways has too narrow of a perspective. Not necessarily on what we've just talked about, but I mean in general as far as the body of Christ, because the church can be very marriage-centric. A hundred years ago, 90% of the adult population between 18 and 64, for whatever reason, that's the adult population. If you're over 64, I don't even know what that means. That's weird. A little over half of the population today is single. That that means that 50.2% of adults in this world today are single adults for various reasons. They've never gotten married. They they've, uh, are single again. And yet, we can kind of, as the church, just always be driving everything through a family lens, through a family lens, through a family lens. And I think it's a mistake. And we could be missing the reality of what God's called us to. And and we want to make it very clear that Scripture says powerfully and clearly that a single within the context of the church body is a first-class citizen in God's economy, given a good godly gift that is absolutely to be maximized for God's glory. Now, I've talked to many singles that say, If I have the gift of singleness, Pastor, I really want to return it like a Christmas gift. Like, like this isn't my cup of tea. This isn't what I feel called to. This isn't, I I, I think God might want more for me. How am I supposed to handle this and live life in in this way? I, I don't think it suits me or fits me. I do want us to realize that God's word does speak to this and that the Bible is not a book on family or marriage, although it addresses it. The reality is it's about the kingdom of God and ultimately about Jesus Christ. Matthew 6.33 really gives us the framework and how we live our lives, right? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And these other areas, these roles that God gives you, they'll they'll work out for you. He's going to help you through them. We tend to forget that the mission of God is bigger than my marriage. I, I can tell you this. You will not come to the end of your days on this earth and God ask you, how happy was your marriage? Tell me your favorite vacation spot that you guys went on. Let me know a little bit more about your your memories together. God is saying marriage is a tool, a sanctification tool that God gives, and it's a metaphor, a metaphor that in one way demonstrates the gospel, and what we're going to see also is singleness is a metaphor that demonstrates the gospel just in a completely different and unique way. So in both ways, there is synergy in the way that it glorifies God. Marriage is is not primary, or even in God's economy necessarily preferred. Matthew 22, verse 30 says this, for in resurrection, neither uh, neither marry nor are given to marriage. And what he's saying is this, in the future kingdom, when we go to heaven, we're going to be more in a sense, like brothers and sisters, as the church body, than we are bride and husband, right? Husband and wife. Why? Because Christ now has married his church, and the metaphor for marriage doesn't necessarily have to be played out in marriage. The bride and the groom, ultimate, Jesus Christ and the church have been brought together. 
So, marriage is not an eternal institution. It's an earthly institution. You say, well, what does that mean for heaven? I don't know. I haven't been there. But what I know is it's not the primary relationship when we get to heaven, like it is on this earth. And so we have to understand that God has a, a different priority in understanding even how he sees marriage than how we see it. The eternal union is Christ and his church, not necessarily myself and my spouse. And so we realize that Scripture never says family first, but always the mission of God and the kingdom of God first as a priority over all things. I think the beautiful byproduct of that, however, is if I do place Christ first in my relationships here on this earth and even the primary relationship of marriage, that that, that is how I will ultimately find happiness. That's how I'll ultimately find flourishing and satisfaction in the context of my marriage. Because Christ is the ultimate satisfier of my soul. My spouse can't handle the weight of my worship. Only Christ can. So whether you're married or single or widowed or divorced, I can tell you this, your sufficiency is all the same in Christ. Period. Do you really believe that God is enough to supply your needs? I realize that being at war against evil for the mission of God together as husband and wife might actually, in a more flourishing way, keep me from being at war with my wife. Why? Because we don't have time to argue. There are bigger things for us to do together. The mission of God, the kingdom of God. I've given this illustration before, but it's kind of like scuba diving. If you both decided that you were going to go, let's say, scuba diving in a beautiful area where there are a lot of fish and there's a beautiful reef there for you to see, and, and you both jump in and you're ready to just enjoy that experience together. But here's the catch. You only have one tank of oxygen. I can guarantee you that it will not be an enjoyable experience even though everything around you is wonderful because you're always going to be worried about where am I going to get my next breath. And so you jump into this circumstance and you're swimming along and the next thing you know, you're tapping your, 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 your spouse on the shoulder and saying, give me, give me the oxygen, give me the oxygen and you take it and you breathe and you breathe and then tapping your shoulder, give me the oxygen and all you're doing is transferring. I have expectations, I have needs, I have expectations, I have needs, I have expectations, I have needs. I'm seeking first you and you are my ultimate and it's all about us. And here's the problem, you're not really living until you both have a tank. And that tank is the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. Then you're free to go down and to look around and to enjoy all that God's given you as a couple. But until then, you're going to be playing tit for tat all the time. Are you free because of your sufficiency in Christ? I have to come to the place, every spouse has to come to the place. My sufficiency is in Christ. It's found in him. And my spouse does not have to give it to me and doesn't have to meet certain expectations and doesn't have to fall in line in certain ways for me to be happy. Colossians 3.1, if then being raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. And verse 2 says, set your minds on things above, not on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What is the goal? Undivided devotion to the Lord and his work. Singles. Don't dream your life away. 
and a constant wait for the right spouse to come and complete you. You are completed in Christ, given a mission to go and make disciples of all nations. The lie out there is the solution to the problem of singleness, which Scripture does not see as a problem at all, is marriage. But that's not biblical. Of course, God and his word values marriage, but it does not overvalue it. I was a young adult pastor for several years, and I loved it. But one of the days, I um, had a whiteboard, and on that whiteboard, I had singleness. And on the other one, I had marriage. And I asked them to give me their perspectives on singleness and dating, and then their perspective on marriage. And it was really interesting, because on the singleness and dating board, they would say things like this. It's unstable. There is heartbreak involved. There is non-commitment. When I start to date someone, uh, it seems to be short-term. There is um, just a repetitiveness to my life that I wish would change, and and, and, an emotional um, disconnect that I feel. And they had a lot of different challenges to being single and dating in single life and how they hated the process of dating. And then I had on another board marriage and they had words like stable, long-term, intimate, godly growth. And I realized very quickly that, boy, they had a distorted view and understanding of what is true. And I said, here's your homework lesson. Go to your nearest bookstore and look at all the books on marriage and come back and tell me what you see. And so they came back the next week, and you know what they told me? All the books are about how to get through the challenges and struggles and problems of marriage. I said, exactly. What you have to understand is this. God's not withholding all good things from you. He's given you a different gift. Marriage is a gift, a gift from God. Singleness is a gift, a gift from God, uniquely given to each of us. In God's timing and in God's providence. And guess what? Both of them are a board of challenges. Both of them are a board of difficulties that come along with that. And so I I challenged them to get serving. And this might sound a little harsh and stop sulking. Can I tell you that they revolutionized that church through their service? They were serving all over the place. And I praise the Lord that here at Bible Baptist Church, we have a steady stable of amazing single and single again individuals that in many ways backbone much of what we do around here. And we applaud them and praise God for them. We would not be the same ministry without their gift. And I'm glad that God gave it to them. We need to be more concerned about what we are becoming in Christ than who is coming into our life. More concerned about God's plan Someone needs directions. <laughs> so, so I just want to say a couple things. If you're a single adult with us, would you forgive the church for not always balancing this truth more? We can do better to engage your giftedness and speak more fully to what frankly is the majority of adults in our world. Secondly, would you forgive me? I know many, many of my illustrations have to do with the family and then you have to do mental gymnastics to try to get it to apply to you. I can do better in that as well. But I wanna make sure that you feel valued and loved at Bible Baptist Church. Your gift is special to us, even if it may be hard and challenging for you. And we praise God for it. 
I often think that if Paul were a part of the local church today, the conversation would be a little strange. It would be like, how odd. He never married. I wonder why. Right? Why is he still single? What's off? Is he socially awkward? Were his standards too high? What's the deal? He must be odd because he hasn't found a companion yet. And certainly, probably wouldn't be a good choice for a leader within the context of our church. Well, how wrong are they on every instance? That is problematic thinking because it doesn't reflect what the word says. As a matter of fact, probably the two most famous people, the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ, live single lives. Are you going to tell me that Jesus Christ wasn't complete? In his masculinity and in that he wasn't a full person because he did not have a feminine partner? Christ is the most perfectly complete, complete individual that ever walked the face of this earth. I do want us to understand a few things as far as the theology for us to kind of go home with here together in this regard. One is both singleness and marriage are God's gift for God's glory. It, it, it's not about us. Marriage is not about you. Singleness is not about you. It's about the glory of God and his providence in our lives. And God cannot give bad gifts. He will not. He does not. And so this is not a, a mystical gift or, or it's not a spiritual gift necessarily as talking about the gift of marriage or the gift of singleness. It just is where God has us. I think sometimes, you know, I, I've been around singles where they'll be talking about things like, you know, I, I, do I have the gift of singleness? I wonder, I wonder. Like it's a, like a mystical thing. Are you single? Yes. That's God's gift for you today at this moment and time embrace it. It's not, a, it's not a special branding. Are you married? Yes. That's God's gift for you. And you have a responsibility with that marriage. Accept it. Enjoy it. Ask God to bring thriving out of it. And both are good gifts. Praise the Lord. Both have individuals sitting here today saying this, I don't want the gift. I'm married and I want to get out of my marriage. My marriage isn't working out the way I wanted it to, the way I thought it would. I want out. This is God's gift for you. Figure it out with him. But I want out of singleness. I hurt so bad. My spouse has gone on and I'm still here. My divorce was so difficult and I, I want to rewrite. I've been alone for a long time and I want a companion to come home to but I'm single. And God would say, this is a good gift. Not an easy one, but a good gift. Maximize it. Use it. If you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we look at verses 6 and 7, it says, now, as a concession, not a command, I say this, I wish that all were as myself. Paul's talking here and he's saying, I wish everyone was single. But each has his own gift from God, one of a kind and one of another. 
He's saying, listen, there are gifts, marriage gifts and single gifts. He goes, my preference would that everyone would be single because I'm really burdened that disciples are made around the world. And I think that being unfettered allows you to accomplish that. But that's not everyone's calling. And everyone has a different gift. So the Apostle Paul is speaking there and he wanted to encourage us in that way. And then he says that... um, in, in, in verses 17, in verses 20, and in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he will talk about being contented, being content where God has you, being content where you are, being content in your giftedness. He continues to pull it out. And, and, and there's a challenge here to all of us, whether we're married or whether we're single, to ask God to bring contentness into that. It's not a waiting around for God's good gift of marriage, but it's instead understanding that that God has graced me with a gift to use. And I have a deep trust in the sovereignty of God. So as hard as it might be, or as challenging as it might be, I'm going to move forward. Or you may be like Paul and say, but this is my preference and I enjoy this. Praise the Lord, move forward. The most contented individual who is not married is the one that can say, I am currently single because God is good and this is the best for me today. It doesn't mean this is what God's good will be for me tomorrow, but God's good for me today and his best for me today is to be single. And I'm good with that. We also see in this context that both singleness and marriage portray the gospel. We realize that um, marriage is a metaphor of Christ and his bride, the church, and how a husband is to serve his wife like Christ serves the church, and there's this beautiful metaphor. But in the context of singleness, right, it is this idea of satisfaction and sufficiency in Christ, and also the idea of the everlasting bride of Christ, that we are more brothers and sisters eternally than we are husbands and wives. And so both, both are demonstrating the ultimate gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One is not a preferred version of the gospel. Both portray the gospel. And you might say, yeah, yeah, but Genesis 2.18, it's not good for a man or woman to be alone. Absolutely true. Praise the God, you're not alone. You have the body of Christ. You have brothers and sisters in Christ that are here, eternally connected with you to do life with. And so we praise the Lord for God's good gift. Both singleness and marriage are for God's glory. Both have unique challenges, both have unique opportunities, and both will have unique rewards. God has a design for both. No one is missing out on God's good design. So don't waste this gift that God's given to you. Maximize it, ask the Lord to give you wisdom and direction, whether you're married or whether you're single or single again in your relationships. Verses 28 through 35 really kind of pulls this out. I think that in view of present distresses, it is good for a person to remain as he is. You are bound to a wife. Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and betrothed a woman marries, and she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. Appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none. So he's saying there are a few reasons to delight in singleness. And reason number one is because the time that we're in is eminent. It's an eminent threat. The Lord will return. And and, and it's a short period of time. And in a sense, what Paul's saying here is this. Listen, singles, you're God's special forces. 
Because it will go on to say that there are a lot of distractions in marriage that you don't have to deal with. You can deal with the mission of God first and foremost. Your special ops for the kingdom of God. To, to embrace that and understand that. Time is short. You're able to maximize your gift better than a married person who has a lot of other concerns to be distracted by. And so, because the time is short, secondly, because of the mission we're on, he says, for the sake of the kingdom of heaven, right? We're on this kingdom mission. The kingdom of heaven is advanced, not in spite of your singleness, but in many ways because of it, because of the, the way that you're engaging in God's kingdom work. And we are to delight in singleness as long as the Lord entrusts it to you. That, that we're to be broken and spilled out for Christ. One of the beautiful things about Mary, a single woman, is that she took her dowry, something worth, worth what would be about $800,000 today in value. She took and broke it and poured it out on Jesus. And if you are single, God is saying, would you pour out your life for my mission? For the period of time that I have you in this place, maximize it, use it for God's glory. And it says, many times in verses 32 through 35 that, that there are affections that will struggle and, and, and an unmarried person is able to be anxious for the Lord while a married person is anxious with family problems and challenges and difficulties. And Paul said, for me, an unfettered life is a gift because of what my call was from the Lord. In verse 37, he says, um, but whoever is firmly established in his heart being under necessity of having this desire under control and has determined this, that the heart keeps her betrothed, he will do well. He's talking about self-control. And, and I am just praying that as a single individual, there's going to be different challenges that come into your life. And one of those challenges is an unholy sexual desire. To, to instead of seeing Christ as your pleasure, to think, well, I'm missing out. Don't reason sexual pl pleasure in that it will make me a complete person. I'm not complete if I'm not sexually engaged. Don't rationalize well, you know, God gave me this energy and, 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 you know, in the Bible times, they were married at like 12 years old and, and uh, here I am at this age and boy, sexual expression and experience are necessary for human flourishing. I should be sexually active. Um, I, I can tell you this, that that's from Freud, but it's not from the Bible. The Christian worldview of worship is that I will not enjoy these things until God opens the door for worship through my sexual activity. And so don't reason, don't rationalize, but run from those temptations. The second challenge is not only these sexual temptations, but also loneliness. Let your soul find home in Christ and connect with his church. Be undivided in your devotion. In verse 38, it says that it's an even better devotion. I just want to call any single within the context of Bible Baptist Church, if you're in a holding pattern in your life, kind of like an airplane just circling around, waiting to be engaged in the ministry and mission of Christ, I want to call you to a full-fledged lead now, love now, serve now, we need you right now mentality. 
Would you be open to diving in and excitedly grabbing the gift that God's given you? We exhort our single brothers and sisters to use their good gift for God's great glory in the world right now. That's our heart, and that's our desire. Thank you for looking at these two critical illustrations and examples of giftedness that God gave us in the scriptures. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, we thank you for marriage. Lord, we pray for our husbands, that they would lead well in the context of their marriages, Lord, that they would love their wife and respect her each and every day for the glory of God and the good of her flourishing. Lord, we pray for our singles, Lord. Would you, would you just encourage them in what can be a challenging gift? And Lord, motivate them for your mission that they would find satisfaction in what ultimately will satisfy, and that is Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Before we have our last worship song here together, I did want to let you know that next Sunday before the service at 9 o'clock, we are having a vision meeting as a church. Um, We're going to be taking a look at um, where God placed us as a ministry, both in time and place. Three miles around Bible Baptist Church, what's going on? What's happening in the culture around us? And during this day and age, what are some areas for us to pray and consider? And then, um, as a leadership team, we, uh, we want us to understand um, some transitions that we might prayerfully be asking the congregation to take with us in different ways. And so, I would love for you to be here next Sunday at 9 o'clock. And then following that, we have a family service, some awesome baptisms, communion together. So, don't miss it. Um, would God bring you here next Sunday if he wills it? Thank you.